from the St. Francis Yacht Club in San Francisco, this is the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, hosted by Ron Young. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. We hope that you and your family are safe, sheltering in place in a comfortable environment, and we look forward to greeting you back in our Yacht Club just as soon as conditions permit. Our speaker today has a fascinating story. In 2002, she put aside her career in corporate banking and many of society's other expectations and pursued a life of adventure. Since then, she's participated in several triathlons and set a world record as the fastest woman to row a million meters in a concept two rowing machine. So it's with great pleasure that we welcome Michelle Lee. Michelle, welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Lunch. Thank you, Ron. Thank you to the members and the guests of St. Francis Yacht Club. This is a pleasure and an honor to be able to share my story with you today. Welcome aboard. I'm gonna take you across a journey um, 68 days across the Atlantic Ocean and hopefully inspire and motivate you to uh, think outside the square, to go and achieve your goals, to dream big. This is the big thing. So uh, I'm gonna show you what rowing across an ocean looks like right now. You just want someone to give you a hug. <laughs> This is Michelle in the Atlantic, somewhere on the 20 degrees latitude. Wow. Uh, I've got to tell you, I don't love going overboard. I'd be braver if there was myself and one other here. But anyway, as Martin Rooney says, you have to go into the raw. It's facing your fears. It's just doing it. Damn, I can see more pippies. So I had to just take the chance and do it. Go, don't even think about it. Get under the boat. I didn't even look down to see what was under me or around. I just looked at the hull and scraped and scraped. As I said, my office today is wild. Words just I can't even describe it. My word is vocabulary adequate to describe what I'm seeing right now. This little fellow landed on my boat. Boo Pretty exciting, right? I better start rowing. The three stages! Thank you, North Cat! Mamma mia! I'm a lucky girl. I've just opened up my hatch door and found this little bird. Look, and I feel like he's just coming to say hi, and he's just there. Hi. My lip is so bad, I've got to cover it up as a better way I know how. Six days to go, maybe seven. It's not looking so swell for me. I just want to get home now. I really do. I just. Welcome on board my rowing ocean vessel, Australian made. She's 7.7 .7 meters long, two meters wide, full carbon fiber hull, and she's a combination of a five and eight mil foam core, fully equipped with everything that is on a major ship. So I've got AIS, GPS, water maker, solar panels, batteries, lithium batteries, you name it, everything's on there. And I also have uh, adequate supplies and provisions for up to one year this time. Uh, what would make somebody who's regular, ordinary, uh, you know, I was nobody special, I was not elite, not an athlete, I wasn't an Olympian and I was not even a rower. So what would make somebody want to go and row across an ocean? Here is where I issue my warning. It is be careful what you read. So thanks to Rowing the Atlantic by Ros Savage, this book plagued me for two whole years consistently and persistently until I decided one day in May 2016, if I don't do this, I'm going to die wondering. So I picked up the phone and I called my bestie and I says, Claudie, guess what I'm going to do? She said, what? I said, I'm going to row across the ocean. I'm going to row the Atlantic. She says, are you, honey? 
how are you going to do that? I said, I don't know, I just got to get me a boat. So, of course, that leads you down all the rabbit holes. I'm trying to speak to people who have been there and done that. And I reached out to the only other Australian who had rowed across an ocean, and it happened to be Andrew in Queensland, so 900 kilometres north of Sydney. Uh, I shot him a message on Facebook saying, how do I become part of this phenomenon? And it literally was uh, that, you know, the, the whole story literally came from reading the book and wanting what Ros Savage had, you know. She overcame every single challenge and obstacle, and that's what it was that was so appealing to me. So uh, to take part in the Atlantic Ocean Row meant rowing 4,600 kilometres or 3,000 miles from La Gomera in the Canary Islands to finish in English Harbour in uh, Antigua. And it was to be a non-stop, solo, unassisted journey. So my first challenge was the marketing nightmare. Here I am trying to attract sponsors and I'm telling them that I'm going to be suffering with salt sores, blisters, uh, fatigue, physical exhaustion. There's going to be capsizing, system failures. And then I'm asking, would you like to come on board? <laughs> when, when they uh, asked me, well, what have you already done? You know, they wanted to validate myself. And, you know, what credentials did I have to do this? Well, I realised there and then that I had really had to step up. I had to go and do something that was out of the ordinary in order to justify the corporates giving me some cash. So that was my first huge challenge and wake up call of uh, what I was about to embark on. Now, the funny thing is when I was out there in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, somewhere on about day 35, I caught myself saying this. Um, still having a marvellous time. I uh, checked in with the, the duty officer today, which ended up being Ian. Normally I speak with Lee, but today I spoke with Ian. And we just had a chat about how great this is and uh, how that if you row another ocean, which you kind of feel like you have to, because you can tweak things now and refine things, things that could have been done better had have I known what I know now and uh, there's lots of those <laughs> so um, the thought goes to what ocean do we do you row next I mean the Pacific's a big one uh, I don't know look it's all just talk at the moment I haven't even finished this one so there I am on day 35 haven't even finished what I'm doing and I'm talking about rowing another ocean so you know I talk about how powerful your words are and your thoughts and you know there I was planting the seed little did I know at the time that uh, you know two years later I would be preparing to row across the Pacific Ocean. When I uh, talk about taking on challenges and stepping outside of your comfort zone, um, reaching for those dreams, I always say that you have to embrace the challenges and there were plenty of challenges before I even got to the start line. My biggest challenge was three weeks just before I was due to ship my boat to the start line when we did the self-writing test. So this was a controlled self-writing test. My boat was built to specific design, so she was a proven design. And um, I'm just gonna show you, whilst I was in my cabin, I'm trying to eliminate my world of firsts. So how do we get it back up? And that's what it looks like from the inside looking out. So like I said, I was inside my cabin. Obviously, my boat should have self-righted by now. And uh, Houston, we have a huge problem. And uh, I will add that it was very unnerving. It was very unsettling to be sitting in there going, oh, what now? I could hear them on the outside saying, oh, so what do we do now? We didn't have a contingency plan because we did not expect this to happen because it was a proven design she should have come back she should have self-righted so because i am addressing yoris and uh, you guys would probably be very curious as to why she did not self-right 
and that is the culprit right there. You are looking at enclosed gunnels. So the moral of my story is do not go and uh, make unconsulted changes to plans. So what we did was we enclosed the gunnels to the deck in order to give me more space. You can see this whole wall here, this whole wall is what, what we added to the plan without consultation. And it was these here that created extra buoyancy to my boat, which made me not self-right. So that was the, the, um, the reason why I didn't self-right. So I had to gut them. I had to go and cut them open and make them, you know, restore it back to the original plan. Now, remember, go back to my marketing nightmare. I uh, had done nothing special in my life. So uh, I realised that I needed to step up and in order to you know give myself credibility and build some you know validation i decided that i would do the million meter challenge which also gave me great basis to learn how to row the rowing technique is very technical and it also gave my body the opportunity to go through all of the fundamental and physiological changes to be a long distance stamina endurance body you know because after all i'd be rowing for 14 hours a day while I was out there, uh, you know, on the ocean. So I um, put it in writing because everything is more powerful when you, you know, you speak it, you tell somebody, you put it in writing and now you are committed. So that is what I did. I committed to doing the million metre row. So that uh, meant that I had to train for six whole months and stick to a very rigid program in order to be match fit for the event um, you know, six months later. And I had some really personal goals there and, you know, what it meant to achieve the goal. So sponsorship, validation, credibility, personal achievement. But I also added one extra layer. And I said to myself, if I cannot achieve this world record in a controlled environment, I was not going to allow myself to go across the Atlantic. So that was just the added pressure that I put on myself. Six months later, we turned up at the um, International Rowing Regatta in Sydney, which is where you go if you want to have a record in rowing, you go and you perform it in this audience and this arena. In order for mine to be a world record, it had to be done in front of a live audience. It had to be validated by people walking past. It could sign a register. There's certain things that you have to do in order to be recognized as a world record. So a little sneaky peek of what my life looks like in uh, you know, getting prepared to do my world record. Start thinking you can and you will. You know, six months ago, I could not row. And here I am today taking on the Million Metre Challenge uh, where I'm rowing 166 Ks per day for six days in a row, which is 14 hours per day. 14 hours per day. Yes, so in order to do the record, I had to row for five and a half days and 14 hours per day. And uh, at the end of it, I ended up taking 11 hours off the world record, which was held by a German Olympic rower. So again, it's just part of my story. You know, here's a picture of my hands at the end of my 68 day row, rowing across the Atlantic. But what these scream is when you put the work in, you reap the reward. So the message is stick to the plan, stay consistent, be persistent, keep your eye on the prize and you absolutely will come through. Did you do anything like stick your hands in salt water? What did you do to treat your hands? Yeah, so um, unfortunately, I waited too long to treat them like an injury. And, uh, you know, obviously with lessons learned now, I will be treating these like a wound much earlier. So the idea is that you need the calluses, you need all this thickened skin um, for protection. However, it gets a bit overzealous. So you need to get some nail clippers or a file and you have to start filing it all down so that it's because it goes so hard so it starts pressing in onto you know your, your fleshy skin underneath so this is actually my hands after my row my actual ocean row and things don't heal well in the middle of the ocean you know um anyone that's done crossings you'll know that if you get a cut they just don't heal well out there in that environment uh, and plus don't forget they never got a rest Every single day without fail, I rode for, you know, between 10 and a half and 14 hours per day. So, um, and I don't wear gloves. 
uh, because that's just another friction point. So my uh, strategy for this time with lessons learned is I will trim the skin more frequently and I also will use a, um, an alcohol on them to keep them nice and dry because it was all very wet and damp inside those little crevices there. They were quite ugly. Um, and I've also got some different hand surfaces on my ore. So I'm going to be rotating different surfaces so I'm not on the same material the whole time. Um, we'll see how that goes. I'll report at the end of my Pacific Road. <laughs> We have uh, the world record, which to this day still stands. Nobody has um, broken it. Someone's come close uh, within uh, about five hours, but they didn't quite make it. So if anybody wants to go and do the world record on the indoor rowing machine, I have the program. I'm willing to share it with you. Records are made to be broken. And I would love to see someone give it a crack. I have the recipe, so put your hand up if you're after that. <laughs> and this is literally the first time I've ever put an oar in water. So when I say I was not a rower, I was, you know, um, new to the sport. I wasn't born with an oar in my hands. This is literally the first time. When we launched my boat in April 2017, this is the first time that I've ever put an oar in water. And this is also the day that I absolutely loved my boat. And I just thought she was the ant's pants. She was the best thing since sliced bread. How much does she weigh? How long is she giving the dimensions? So from bow to stern, she is 7.7 .7 meters long. So she's just under 25 foot. And her beam is two meters wide. She is full carbon fiber. So that this hull empty without anything inside was less than 200 kilos. She's light. Kilos. She was less than 200 kilos. 440 pounds. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Victor. Good work. Okay, this is a good time to introduce Victor. Nobody sails across the ocean or rows across the ocean without an incredibly important ground crew. We're joined today by Victor Felice. Victor, tell us, give us your background in a couple of sentences. Really simple. I grew up sailing in Malta in the Mediterranean as a kid, uh, then sailed a bit in Switzerland moved to the States for university, didn't sail for a long time. And I've been sailing again for the last, uh, you know, 10 plus years. I own a sailing school in Arizona on Lake Pleasant. Uh, we do anything from, you know, Sabbaths to C-15s, a large fleet of J-24s, Etchells, Stars, and the like, and do quite a bit of sailing in Mexico also. And literally met Michelle uh, on, a, on a Facebook post that she did about bringing a boat into Mexico. And, you know, people give their opinions and, oh, and you need this and you need that. And I'm in Arizona. We go to Mexico all the time with boats. So I, I sent a little message saying, you know, don't listen to these people. That's not the way it's done. And no idea what she's doing or what kind of boat, right? So that's how it started. So she tells me, well, so I'm taking my rowboat. I'm like, well, easy enough. But then it's not just a rowboat. And it just grew from there. I'm like, this is fascinating. I want to get involved. Let me help you. And, uh, you know, we started from there and arranged shipping on and on and on. Boat ends up in Oakland, at which point there was some uh, issues in California. So I reached out to Rich Jepson, uh, president of U.S. Sailing and obviously a St. Francis member. And generally, when if I call Rich, he knows it's going to be something very, very strange. So this one actually topped everything that came before. And I said, Rich, I need your help. I need this boat from Oakland. Can you take it to the St. Francis maybe for a day or two till we can get a truck, pick it up? So that's how the uh, St. Francis got involved. So Rich, thank you so much. And then his friends, obviously, who helped in there. And the boat was with you at St. Francis, what, Michelle, two, three days, two days? Yep, two days. Which, which I thought was brilliant. I mean, I enjoy, uh, you know, I enjoy getting involved in, in strange projects, but I like everybody to get involved. And as I was explaining to Michelle, I said, if you, if you, even that the fact that your boat was parked in the parking lot of the St. Francis, it's a big deal. I said, enjoy the moment, right? <laughs> it's just a really wonderful, wonderful thing. And hopefully some of the members got to actually see such an incredible, uh, you know, different craft. We're all, you know, J boats and swans and, you know, the usual sailing boat stuff. You never see something like this. It's a truly unique, unique uh, boat. And it's part of what we do, things on the water. So anyway, so the boat's on its way down to uh, Ensenada. And I've been doing a lot of the, uh, 
you know, the groundwork and burning through favors like you can't believe, but I think it's very much worth it for Michelle because it's just fabulous. So that's really where it started and it's been an amazing journey and I'm not rowing anywhere, I'm driving, so. Okay, Michelle, uh, tell us more about this boat. Um, you got GPS, tell us about your navigational system. Uh, so on board, I have all of the Simrad gear by Navico. So I've got the uh, NSS Evo 3 chart plotter. I've got autopilot, uh, water maker, uh, 350 watts of solar panel, three 75 amp hour lithium batteries. There's a four man life raft, uh, VHF radio, I have a sat phone, you name it, she has it. Obviously now I am provisioned for a whole year uh, worth of dehydrated meals predominantly, as well as plenty of, you know, jars of peanut butter, Nutella, there's fruit cakes, there's high energy bars, protein powder, um, supplements, protein supplements, there's hydration powders. And uh, if I'm lucky, I might catch a fish or two. So uh, that's on my to-do list uh, to learn how to fish. Um, and uh, it can just be a very nice supplement and morale booster. You know, uh, anyone that's done an ocean crossing will know we obsess over two things the most. One is what we're going to eat next and two, the weather. So uh, it's no different for me when I'm out there. Uh, food is definitely a massive morale booster. And obviously when we do these kind of things, we need the trade winds. So it's not so much, uh, you know, we get to choose when we're departing, it's based on weather. And that's what I'm doing right now in Mexico. I'm waiting for A, my boat, but B, also a weather window where I can get off the shore. So coming in and exiting are our two, two most challenging parts of our journey. And uh, our boats being, you know, look at the windage on her, look at the length of her. She is not built to be around land. You mean she's built to be offshore, you mean? She, because, you know, with the windage on her, if it's blowing the wrong direction, I'll just get blown into land. Whatever that, that land um, coastline is, I'll be slammed into that. Um, so that's why we need to have following wind seas and currents. Um, you know, we need to have everything in our favor, helping pushing us to the finish line. What routing am I looking at? Is this a previous crossing by multiple boats that are different colors? Is that yes. what this yeah, so this this is a picture of my crossing. So when I did my Atlantic row, there was actually 34 boats at the start line. And there was a combination of fives, fours, trios, pairs, and five solos in my race. And this is what we look like. We are, you know, uh, being pushed by the wind. You can see the weather arrows. They are pushing us um, west. And so obviously we were in some beautiful easterlies. As predicted, you know, all of our oceans have uh, predicted weather. I am, there I am, the little blue one, um, Australian maid, you can see the name above my boat. So this is not a good day. See, I'm being pushed northwest. Uh, I just want to go west. And you can see some other boats, one, you know, one's heading back to the start line. And this is just the weather. This is what happens with the wind. This is what it does to our boats. We get shoved around a whole lot by the wind and heavily rely on, um, you know, easterlies, if we're rowing west, that is. So that's the reality of ocean rowing and I guess anything to do with the ocean, if you're sailing, um, you're at the mercy of mother nature. To know that you are gonna be faced with challenges makes it a little bit easier if you have acceptance before you depart, knowing that things are not always gonna go your way but what I didn't know and what I wasn't prepared for was the constant every single day. You're on edge, you know, you're always stressing about the weather. So, um, and then all the little tiny things start compounding. You know, I had a toothache, I had an earache, things started breaking on my boat, my water maker was sucking air, my foot steering fell apart. And these are the things that just, um, you know, make something already challenging even more so. So here's a little sneaky peek of some of those days. I just want to be in, in human contact. Well, my dilemma in the immediate now is what to have for dinner. And truly, once upon a time, brushing my hair used to be quite a pleasurable experience for me. However, 
<laughs> well, this is now the um, latest thing that I'm now nursing because the arm broke. Count the state of today. No wind, no assistance. This is hard, hard work. So different to just, what, two days ago. That's when I was having my nervous breakdown. Well, today is a very sad day. It's my last jar of Nutella. Man, it's been a dreadful night. Oh, I've been just getting whacked along this whole side, my starboard side. Just like yesterday, no wind. Uh, and with the wind that I have, it's a northerly. I want to go that way. <laughs> so, you know, transferring all my really light stuff, which is in the very front one, to the aft one because uh, I feel like I'm going nowhere fast and I can just see my boat sitting like that. The bum of it is in the water and the nose is so high. So I've just got a yearning to get home now. I really do. I think it's day 11. I... <sighs> I'm feeling pretty tired. Hands. Whoa, mama, look at that. And I've done all the things to try to make me feel better. I made myself a cup of Earl Grey, a cup of tea. Look at that. Mm. Yeah, that hurt, but what are you gonna do? Sit in your cabin and cry? Uh, well, my finger's bothering me, that one there. We had two catastrophes today when my jet boil got knocked over, of course, because we're on a moving platform. Fire in my footwell everywhere. The rear hatch open, which is that way. Just a little bit, not even fully. And whooshka, a wave came in drenched my cabin. I have had some water maker problems which I handled first thing this morning. Well here we are on day four. I have had uh, a really good rowing day but a shitty day because I lost my GoPro Hero 7 overboard. <laughs> Oh, that was a call. Because we are nursing so many things on board now. Nursing my foot steering. We're nursing the rudder. Now as I get closer, um, and I, I must be, I don't know, 10 to 12 days out now. I mean, I'm really on edge, really anxious because I need all my equipment to last. Um, and uh, I just feel like I'm always on edge. So that is an idea of uh, what goes on on a daily basis out there um, and how your mood can change so rapidly. Uh, you can be in a state of overwhelm and despair and then a dolphin will just come up or a pot of whales or a bird and it just completely lifts your spirits and uh, changes your whole mood in an instant. So uh, it's a bit of a roller coaster, uh, but there is something that, you know, is drawing me to go back and do it again. Um, mainly, it's the idea that I'll be able to do it better with lessons learned, you know, knowing what I know now, if I had it known then, obviously, and uh, the ability to refine and tweak my boat, which is what we've done. We've, you know, brought her into the work shed, we've simplified systems, we've overhauled the rudder, beefed it up so that, you know, she's got nice big stainless steel fittings now, um, simplified my steering, and we've automated a lot of stuff. So my water maker pickup, we've uh, plumbed it into the boat now, into the hull. Uh, we've also given me a, um, an electric bilge pump. So every day I used to have to empty my uh, foot well by hand, manually pumping it. So just these little things will make my life day to day a whole lot easier uh, for the Pacific Row. And you gotta remember, I'm gonna be out there for a whole lot longer. So. Uh, in my story, I really would love uh, you to take away some messages of um, dream big and uh, don't die wondering and to start thinking you can and you will, which was my motto. It became my mantra. Um, and I just say yes. So, you know, uh, I always love 
people to know that you can step out of the queue. You don't have to just be handed, you know, what someone thinks is, you know, society, this is what you get now. No, step out of the queue. You can rewrite your own rules and um, create your own. So I think that that's my main message out of um, my Ocean Rose. What an incredibly um, fascinating story, Michelle, and congratulations on getting across the Atlantic and for knowing that you've done that, taking on the Pacific. Some questions. Where will you leave from? Where's your debarkation point? Uh, so it's from Ensenada, from the Coral Marina, and that's thanks to the scouting works of Victor. And, you know, he's been in and out of this marina. He's done the new port to Ensenada. So he gave it rave reviews and uh, said it's got everything you need. So this is where we're going to depart from. Uh, I've got a great crew here in the marina that have stepped up. It's amazing how people just step up, you know, like what your guys did at the uh, yacht club to go and collect my boat. You had like five or six names just ready to go at the drop of a hat. Uh, it's insane. Paul Victor, you know, he didn't read the fine print that says there is no exit clause. <laughs> These people are stuck with me now. But, um, you know, it's, it's something about people coming on this journey with me that uh, hopefully they do get something out of it as well. Where are you going to land? Where's your destination for Sydney is my um, dream uh, destination. That's what I keep visualising, is rowing through Sydney heads under the Harbour Bridge. You know, I'm a Sydney girl. Makes sense that I want to, you know, finish my journey in Sydney. You know, where, which harbour are you going to go into once you get in? Side harbour, where are you going to birth the boat? Where are you going to keep it? The um, Maritime Museum in Darling Harbour, they have specifically requested that I go in there because they hosted me for a few months during my prep. So they said, please, Michelle, you've got to row in to us. We'll have a big party. So I, I certainly do owe it to them to go into um, the Maritime Museum. And it's, it's perfectly fitting, right? What's the distance? It is 14,000 kilometres or 8,000 nautical miles. But what's the ballpark of when you're planning to leave? Uh, in a perfect world, I would like to try to get out of here by the end of July. Um, so, you know, if I've received my boat in the next couple of days, I'll go out and do a couple of days worth of sea trials, you know, run my batteries, run all my systems, my water maker, um, my autopilot. And then when I'm absolutely certain and happy that my boat's A1, I make a break. I just give it a go. Now, what's your sleep cycle? What's your planned sleep cycle? I will do something very similar to my previous row. Uh, I'm big on tried and tested methods. So I used to pretty much treat it like a job. I'd be up at 5 a.m. out on deck and ready to sit on the oars rowing by 6 a.m. And I would row till about 10 p.m. So I would, you know, row in three hour shifts with a half hour break to eat a full meal. So it's all about keeping your calories up. Um, I will be consuming 7,000 calories per day. 7,000 calories a day. Yeah. So the average lady eats about 12 or 1,400 calories a day. I'm eating 7,000. It's a license to eat whatever you want, girls. <laughs> so you've also attracted video resources. Uh, when you go across, what kind of video camera will you be using or cameras? Uh, and tell us about, is there going to be a couple of still mounted ones? And tell, us, tell us your video gear. Um, I'm not much of a tech head. I struggle with technology, so we're keeping it as simple as possible. And I just have a, a GoPro Hero 8 and a GoPro Hero 7. That is it. Oh, and my phone. So um, this time I do have the ability to send footage home using the BGAN, uh, which is like a, a modem using the satellites. I can send some very short clips home. And I'll probably do that recording from my phone and use WhatsApp to send, you know, 30 and 40 second clips back home. So that's the next question. How are you going to keep shoreside viewers, spectators, um, a current on what you're doing day after day after day? We have a broadcast at a certain time and where will it be uh, distributed? So I'll give you the link to, it's the Yellow Brick app that I'll be using. Um, so everyone will download the Yellow Brick Races app on their phone, they go and find Great Pacific Row, and then they can check me out any hour of the day. It's updated every four hours. My uh, position will be plotted every four hours, and they can become an addicted dot watcher, basically, uh, watching me slowly make my way across the 
Pacific. It'll be. <laughs> I didn't do the math. You're crossing your Atlantic crossing. Um, you, how many? You said 68 days, and that was 3,000 miles. So do the math. What, what was your average speed? Uh, about 2.4 knots. <laughs> 2.4 knots per hour. Okay. What do you expect your Pacific crossing to be like? I would anticipate about the same. Um, I, I would expect the same. So I'm thinking I'll be out there for about 200 days. In a totally still environment, when you row the boat in the same with the same amount of load that you normally would row in calm waters, how fast does the boat go? Uh, I can pull very comfortably 3.2. If there's no wind and no current against me, I can sit on 3.2 and I can chat to you the whole time. So, you know, it's not a sprint. Remember, this is a stamina endurance. So everything's just tick it over, keep it going. But yeah, out there, obviously, I will be faced with, um, I'll be getting hit beam on sometimes. I, you know, I'm just not going to have 100% ideal days. But, you know, there are days when you are surfing four and five meter swell and you're you're picking up you know i'm watching my chart plot and i'm doing eights nines and tens down the face of a wave so these boats are designed to surf the waves they're awesome on a wave um and if i had that the whole way man i'd be overdone with it probably 150 days what's the top speed you actually achieved in the pacific crust in any given moment of going down a wave uh yeah 10 or 11 knots down the face of a wave but it's very it's very brief you know you see it and then boom. <laughs> what are you doing when you're not rowing the boat on the boat uh there's a lot of maintenance and tasks that need to be done you know daily chores so things like wiping over your solar panels removing any salt crust so that they're working 100 percent efficiently uh, i go around with a screwdriver and i tighten things i check my wheel bearings frequently there's water to be made every day. Now, like I said, we've, uh, we've simplified that system. Now I literally just have to flick a switch, whereas last time there was a whole rigmarole of setting up my water maker. Um, other chores that I do, oh, I go overboard and scrape my hull because my uh, boat does grow and develop some you know, growth and crustaceans that slow you down. So there will be times when I have to go under and scrape it. Um, hopefully I'll feel... How often are you scraping the bottom? Uh, I had to go over four times in 68 days last time. So, you know, pretty much, uh, I'd say every couple of weeks you got to go over. Talk to me about a scary moment in the Atlantic crossing. Day 46. It was noted as worst day ever in my diary. And it was just a day when everything seemed to be going wrong. You know, I was getting hit from the wrong angle. I had wind against wave. I had an earache, I had a toothache. It's when my foot steering fell apart. And it just seemed that, you know, the smallest next thing was like a mountain out there. And that's what happens. And that's when, you know, you've really got to uh, get a, a check on your mind state and reel it in. You've just got to reel it in and get control again. So um, this time I've actually got some really good mind tools um, that I've practiced for the last two years so that I hopefully don't end up in those uh, states of mind of overwhelm and despair and, you know. Um, so meditation, very powerful. I'll be using a lot of meditative, um, guided meditation. And um, power of positive thinking, you know. Um, also having that ground crew who has the ability to do a, um, a check reason and logic so tony who was my dpa he was the guy i checked in with every day he would say to me all right michelle is your boat broken no are you broken no is your watermaker working yes is, is your um chart plotter working yes have you got your radio yes and he just goes through all this stuff and then he'd go you are fine and it's like oh so like you know he just brought everything back to reality and that whole sense of me being a drama queen was so you need that person at home who's willing to be a little bit hard uh, on you to sort of settle you down. <laughs> so talk to us about your, your physical plant, you personally. What, how tall are you? Can you tell us what, what your physical condition is, what you weigh? So uh, I am five foot five. 
and I weigh in kilos at the moment, I'm 70 kilos. So I've had to put on, they wanted me to put on 10 kilos for this row. I put on about eight. Um, they, they, you know, decided that I need to go carrying some extra body fat because it will help sustain my muscle mass longer. So in my first row, I lost 14 kilos in 68 days. And uh, you are losing your muscle mass. So you end up being weaker. And they said, if, you know, you can put on some mus some fat now. You'll just maintain your muscle longer. It's inevitable. You're going to lose weight. You can't not, even though you eat 7,000 calories every single day. And I don't suffer with seasickness. So there's not one day where I'm vomiting and struggling to keep my food down. I ate every single meal without a problem. So it's just that you are consuming so much energy. And then even in your resting moments, because you're on a relentlessly moving platform, all your stabilizers, everything are always constantly firing. You never completely rest. Um, so at the moment, I am physically, I'm prepared totally. Like I have no doubt. And the, you know, hours on the oars, that's the least of my problem. That really is the least of my problem. Sleep deprivation, it doesn't seem to affect me. Um, I have a power nap at, at one o'clock every day, a 20 minute power nap I had every single day on the Atlantic. And that was gold. That just got me through, takes the edge off. Um, and I've just done a lot of uh, very uh, specific weight training for rowing. So lots of stuff for my lower back, for my uh, stabilizers of my shoulder, for even just all through your elbows and your forearms. So I've done a lot of hanging, suspended yeah. stuff so that I don't get those overuse tendonitis style injuries. Um, and also I've been rowing on a rowing machine, boring. Uh, so in a, oh, look, uh, it's more about doing deadlifts than pressing. So uh, we'll do sets of 80 kilo deadlifts. I might do six, four sets of six sets in different um, variations. So, and then I'll do a lot of um, straight legged deadlifts and a lot of Romanian deadlifts. So that I'm, you know, long levers under load using barbell, slow, controlled. That's the kind of uh, style of training that I'm doing, which is working a treat. It's really, really been um, gold. Do you deliberately fish and how and when? Um, I did not at all across the Atlantic because I was in race mode. So in, you know, it, it was a race and I wanted to beat the um, other solo rower who was in the same class boat as me. So I did not fish. However, I can see the benefits of fishing uh, for the morale boost and just nutrition, you know, getting that nice fresh protein and some good fat. Um, so I do have all the gear, but still no idea. I'm bored. I have a rod holder ins installed on my boat. I've got a rod. I've got lines and hooks all ready to go. Um, someone from here in the um, marina is going to take me out and they're going to make me catch a fish. And as you know, killing the fish, that's my problem. You know, I said, well, can I just hang it and just let it? He said, that's cruel, Michelle. You're gonna have to get a knife in there under the gill and just, Poof. I'm like, oh, that's just so traumatic to me. But, you know, I know that the benefits will outweigh the trauma. So I just gotta get my heading, you know, around so the idea. Troll, so it sounds like you're gonna be trolling. Is that what you'll troll? Yeah, I will, I will troll. Um, but, you know, underneath my boat, I had like an aquarium. I always had mahi-mahi, I had yellowfin tuna under my boat constantly. So what happens is your boat becomes a fad, a, a floating aggregating device. So if you throw a log in an ocean, it will attract fish. They go to it for shade and for the growth that it, it grows, you know. So um, I know for a fact I'm going to have a lot of life under there and you just put a thing in, a hook, You'll get something for sure. Oh, give me the fishing gear. What kind of gear are you going to have? Yeah, I just have a, a short rod um, with a reel. And also I'm having a hand um, a hand reel made by one of the guys here in uh, Coral Marina. He's going to look after me. So a um, bit of hand fishing. And when I'm trawling, I'll throw my line out um, on the on the fish, uh, sorry, on the uh, rod holder. Um, see how it goes. <laughs> what about music? What are you listening to? You listening to anything? 
yes, I have um, carefully selected material on my iPod. So in terms of uh, books, it's all mind um, empowering kind of stuff. So Dr. Joe Dispenza, Dr. Bruce Lipton, uh, Abraham Hicks, these are my go-to. There's Bob Proctor. Um, and then my podcasts, they're all about yeah, motivational inspiration. So David Goggins, when you need a good kick in the pants, you play a little bit of David Goggins. Um, and then I will also be learning Spanish. So I'm going to get the Audible Learn Spanish. So I hope that when I get off in Sydney, I'll be able to have uh, basic conversational, you know, Spanish skills that people will actually be able to converse with me because I intend to come back to Ensenada. So... What kind of food, what, how much food are you bringing? How much will it weigh and what are you eating? I have 145 kilos worth of dehydrated meal. So the space food style stuff, um, which is pretty much add hot water, give it a little mix, wait five minutes and then eat mush from bag. I have 145 kilos of that. So I'll have three meals a day, three hot meals served with rice every time because rice bumps up your calories. It's good carbohydrate. Uh, and then I will also be having oats every morning. So Uncle Toby's oats, I love the porridge, which I will be putting nuts into, you know, macadamia nuts, particularly because they're high in fat. I have coconut oil that I can add to anything and everything. Again, it's bulking up my fat. And I also have about 35 days worth of tin food, which is my emergency rations. So I only go to that in the event that I can't make water, um, or that I can't, you know, get out on deck. I have, um, you know, just open a tin and eat your, your baked beans, your, uh, what have I got, chicken in a can. I can have chicken in a can with cream corn. I can <laughs> have tuna with a tin of peas and beans. Oh, no, peas and carrots. Um, <laughs> they're my combos that I have. But um, in terms of dehydrated meals, I've got about 13 different flavours. So uh, I shouldn't suffer too much with the flavour fatigue. Cans. What do you do with an empty can? I have a can crusher. So I'll crush it down, you know, to next to nothing. And I will be bringing home all my refuse. Yeah, so I, I keep all my rubbish. Yeah, right. absolutely. And that was, that was part of the uh, race rules for the Atlantic Ocean Road. You were scrutinised. At the end of the race, you had to bring out all your rubbish and it was all accounted for. Batteries, everything. No, no booze? Any booze? Oh, yes. I'm actually taking a litre of Kahlua because my flatmate back in Sydney, every full moon, we're both going to have a nip of Kahlua. So um, when it's... The full moon will both and we'll both be sort of thinking of each other going you know she'd be obviously having hers um tomorrow versus me i'll celebrate it first uh -huh. but it's just like a little tradition traditions rule um and rituals they're very grounding do you know what i mean and they're just something to look forward to so i've put a few of those in now you said earlier your work day is gonna you're gonna wake up at at five work until i uh, get to work at six so I do three hour shifts. I'll do um, a six till nine. Then I'll have my half hour break. Then, you know, you're back on the oars for definitely by 10 till one, have another break. Then I'll have a little, I actually have a 20 minute nap there. So there might be an hour's break there in that day. So I'll do four, three hour rowing shifts per day. That's your 12 hours. And then I finish between sort of eight and 10 PM. I do one last rowing shift. Um, and then I stow and store the boat as though I'm going to get capsized and I'm going to be in a horrendous storm. So every night before I go into my cabin, everything on deck is stowed and stored for, you know, worst case scenario. Even if it's a calm night, I don't care. It's just a routine and a habit that I um, adopt and maintain. And then, like I said, I just finished that last rowing shift with my cup of Earl Grey to look forward to and my hot pudding. And I sit there looking out from my, my cabin, reflecting on today, um, and you're so tired. By the time you lay down, three, two, gone. Don't even count three, two, one. You're gone. <laughs> and what time are you usually going to sleep then? Between sort of 10, 10.30. I'll be asleep. I'll be out. Lights out. 
So if you go to bed at 10 30, that's one and a half plus five. So you're getting six and a half hours of sleep ish in that one span. Is that about no, right? No, no. So going across the Atlantic, I didn't plan this, but I was up every hour on the hour between the hours of 10, 10 30 till five. And I would get up and I would come outside, open my hatch, make sure I, you know, um, scout the horizon, make sure there's no shipping, no lights that I can see, but my chart plotter might not pick up. And I would also check my chart plotter. So you're always listening for her because if she starts going, this, this, this is going crazy, I've got to go crack her off a few degrees because I don't want her to burn out. So, you know, my, my priority was keeping the boat at the tightest angle to the wind in order to maintain the west that I needed. Um, and, you know, sometimes, like I said, it meant that you've got to crack the uh, autopilot off a few degrees. That's okay, as long as she's happy because she made my life so easy. Now, steering doesn't work unless the boat's moving through the water. So when you're asleep at night, um, what is the autopilot doing? Whenever the boat does start to move, it steers the boat the course you want. Is that what happens, going down a wave, et cetera? Yeah, so it would just basically hold you on that rough bearing. And um, as long as I've got momentum from the um, wind and the seas, the sea state, uh, she's okay. So what we've done is we've dulled it right down to the uh, lowest setting so that she's not oversensitive. Right. Um, and then she just makes those little corrections. You know, you, you just listen to yeah. it. It's music to my ears. When, how often did you see ships going across the Atlantic? Um, uh, probably for the first uh, two or three weeks, I didn't see much. And then, um, I don't know, I reckon 68 days, I probably recorded a dozen ships and one came to visit me. They actually diverted their course to come over and check me out. They did circles around me. They took photos. They updated Facebook. <laughs> So now where, how do they know, how does anybody know you're out there? Essentially, if they weren't following you, like we hope people will after this broadcast, how would anybody else, how would it ship? Are you on AIS? Yeah, I have AIS. So I give and receive and um, uh, which means that, you know, I can find them on my chart plotter and uh, I can click on them. It will give me their boat name, their boat speed, their bearing, their flag, where they're flagged, so that I can then get on the radio and call them by name and, and just make sure that they can see me. So I always did that. Whenever I saw a ship on my chart plotter, I would jump on the radio and just ask them to acknowledge that they see me. I would tell them I'm an ocean rowing boat. I have no motor, no sails. I cannot get out of your way. Um, so it was my peace of mind to do that. You have a land control, a land project manager with Victor. Um, Victor, um, what's, a, what's your biggest concern with this uh, unbelievably fun and yet meaningful assignment? What's your biggest concern? Surprisingly, knowing Michelle for a while now, absolutely none. My, my biggest concern is will I deliver on time when I said it's going to be there? And, you know, a lot of the don't worry. I've got this covered, so, which, which so far has worked out pretty fine, which in fact, just as a quick aside, right, because, you know, we know in sailing and water sports, how everybody complains, oh, it's too expensive, it's too difficult. I'm driving down to San Carlos with my friend Faris Sukar, and I mentioned I was on Facebook talking to some woman in Australia about some boat, and he goes, oh, you need to meet my friend Enrique. So the next week we're going down to Mexico, Enrique joins us, Enrique. As a total aside, I'm chatting with this woman from Australia who's going to row a boat. I told her to go to Ensenada. Oh, don't worry about it. My brother's in Ensenada. Okay, fair enough. Uh, so Michelle, meet Fernando. He is Enrique's brother. These make names mean nothing to her, right? So, so I, haven't, I haven't met Fernando. He meets her at the airport at Tijuana, picks her up, and he goes, okay, well, where are you going to stay? And she goes, you stay at my sister's house. Right? So... So now she's getting a full Mexico treatment. In the meantime, they say, oh, you're a sailor. You need to meet this German guy. And I'm like, okay, how are we getting Germans involved now? No, 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 no. His name is Bodo Weber. He's the Commodore of the club Nautico Baja. Okay. I mean, I was, you know, vice commodore of my club for a while and everything. I'm like, okay, so I pick up the phone and we start talking in German and Spanish and English. We decided let's just speak English. And I'm telling him the story, right? So I have this lady from Australia. She's at Fernando's house. 
can, can you do me a favor here? <laughs> so, so he goes up, well, their club is at the Hotel Corral. That's where all the boats are. So, you know, they go in there. And when we originally first emailed the hotel, they didn't really reply. But when she, when Michelle showed up with, uh, with the Commodore, the marina manager put two and two together very quickly. And it's like, oh, my God, you flew from Australia quicker than I answered your email. So now it became, again, one thing led to the other. So, you know, so when, when uh, yeah, I mean, I do get involved in a lot of really bizarre projects and fun projects like this that, you know, you only do once in your lifetime. I'm not going to row, but I'll only be involved once in somebody who's going to row. And that to me is, you know, fair enough, right? It's, it's good enough. And there's so many good people that you can reach out to. And it doesn't take effort. It doesn't take anything extraordinary. We all know these things. You know, if you give good, honest advice, well, actually, no, good, honest opinion. Generally, don't give advice, but opinions are, are okay. But they have to be honest. And, you know, put yourself out there. I mean, like I said, for me, I'm not rowing anywhere. I like sales and, you know, inboard diesels and stuff like that. But... I can say one day, yeah, I know, Michelle, I was, I was involved with that a little bit, you know, and I got the St. Francis involved and I got the club Nautico Baja involved and I got this German guy in Sonata and then Enrique's sister's house. And it's an amazing story, right? It just makes me very, very happy as a sailor, you know, as a, somebody who spends a lot of time on the water to be able to do this. If you were to throw a dot across the room and make a guess, what day are you targeting you want to get to Sydney? come through the entrance of the harbour? I would love to be able to do it in um, 200. I, I really would love to be able to do it in 200 or less. Uh, you know, the, the three day, it's taken somebody 189, 209 and 336. So the three people that have crossed the Pacific nonstop, solo, unassisted, took 189, 209 and 336. So, you know, I'm going to be in that, that range. I'd like to think I can do it in the 200-ish. So it's been fascinating to listen to your perspective on doing this. What's your biggest worry? Um, look, isolation does take its toll on you. And um, it's, I'm a massage therapist, so I touch. I missed human connection, human touch, and human kindness the most. Um, I know that it will still be a struggle, although I do have a strategy for that now. You know, when I talked about all of my mind tools that I have in the little toolkit, uh, I'm using the Jose Silva method and we have some really great simple strategies so that hopefully I don't suffer. In fact, I know I won't suffer as much because I've been practicing it. So it's now tried, tested and proven and it's not just something out of a textbook. It's something that I, uh, you know, shout about now. So uh what else would be a big worry uh you know like i said sleep deprivation didn't end up being my problem so cross that off the list storms you know i'm in the pacific hurricanes typhoons cyclones apparently they're frequent but less intense compared to the atlantic so it's you know yeah storms i guess you know they, they're always going to worry anybody on the water you have an in and out on the boat to show us how much breeze you've got? What's the uh, yes, I do. I have. What you saw in the Atlantic? Oh, 30, 30 knots maximum. So, you know, I had a maximum sea state of four metres and 30 knots of wind. Um, so that's quite mild, you know. That's very mild. Uh, now, you came from the world, you retired from the world of corporate banking. So I couldn't let this interview go by without asking you about sharks. Are you, do you, have you, did you have any experience with sharks when you were crossing the Atlantic? I didn't see one. Um, I, you know, I know they're out there, but I didn't see them. And, you know, every time I had to go overboard, obviously my uh, imagination was very vivid with, you know, a shark being under the boat. Um, never saw one. And the Pacific might be a bit of a different uh, story. I know that they're out there. Uh, they're more prominent in the Pacific Ocean. So you just have your wits about you before you go overboard, do a little bit of a scout around and, you know. Uh, but I, I now have a new reason and logic with sharks, and that is that while ever there is tons of fish underneath my boat, there's no sharks around because if there was a shark, they're going to scamper. They're going to just all scatter, aren't they? So while ever there's fish, I'm going to feel very safe. 
Michelle Lee, it's been fascinating listening to your story, uh, admiring your courage, your tenacity, and your uh, mindset. Um, we couldn't wish you more uh, good fortune as you take off on your cross. Victor, thank you so much from the Yachty community in general for supporting Michelle and being just a great mate all the way around. We can see that uh, in, your, uh, in your participation with her. As Victor said, um, you know, or as he suggested, it's having friends everywhere that really is helpful in an engagement like this. And uh, we want you to know that the St. Francis Yacob community is uh, available to you at the asking. Contact us anytime you want, and we will do our very best to accommodate you. We admire people who've got such tenacity, such follow through, such incredible ambitions, and such successes as you, as you had already. So, uh, with that, thank you so much for being our guest on the Wednesday Yacob Luncheon. It's been a pleasure and a privilege. Thank you for everything, everybody. Thanks. Ron, thank Thanks, you. Ron. Thank you, St. Francis. presentation of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon.